Hello and welcome to this video and I would like to welcome my friend Steve Gould. We're shaking hands for the third time today. <laughs> right, we've shot three videos this week. We've talked about Gentle Giant, we've talked about Focus. Steve is one of the most knowledgeable people I know in terms of progressive rock. Um, we call him the Progmeister because <laughs> he is the Progmeister. <laughs> He's got a YouTube with a whole ton of stuff on which the link will be in the top of the comments here. He's got his own radio show. To tell a little bit about the radio yeah, show. Yeah, I go out on uh, it's MMH, the home of rock radio, and also Progzilla. If you're familiar with that particular channel, uh, we go out on MMH. It's MMHradio.co.uk. We go out every Sunday at 1600 hours, three hour show. You have to have it that long. UK time, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have it that long to fit in all the long tracks. <laughs> uh, and then we go out on Progzilla at 1500 hours. That's Progzilla.com every Monday, so you've got two chances to catch it, plus obviously we put it out as a podcast. It's called The Lost Art, I've been doing that for the last seven and a half years, and during that time uh, we've included interviews with a fair amount of people. Uh, the last show, last week, we had Francis Dunnery, the week before that we had Aaron Clift from the Aaron Clift Experiment, and uh, I tried to incorporate a mix of new and old, you know, because mm. although you have to give due credit to what's gone before, I do feel that people need to embrace the newer side of prog because you know there's some people out there and I'm not pointing any fingers but there are people out there who haven't moved past 1975. Me! <laughs> <laughs> he's one of them! <laughs> so this is, this is why I thought I'd get Steve on and, he's, he's, and I know that I don't cover enough modern progressive rock on here and I know Steve's right. Now some of the niggles, niggles I have about modern progressive rock I think are valid and we're going to get into this into this conversation but there is a ton of incredible progressive rock out yeah. there I'm missing out <coughs> a lot of it yeah like I said to you on, on the label that I'm on you know my band range is signed to GEP records which is run by IQ and on there is Solstice now Solstice has been going for over 40 years yeah but um I thought oh I'll check out their their last two albums on the on GEP see what they're like I put them on and I just thought they're absolutely incredible yeah. and I thought I'm missing out on this yeah not not to only new bands but also old bands that are making yeah. the best they've ever made yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. so we're going to try and get into that and then i really want to bring steve back quite regularly to um as long as you have me yeah we will have you back anytime <laughs> so, so to talk about you know to, and he'll be bringing in some albums but we're just going to have a general chat about the progressive rock scene so let's start with your festival because as well as running a radio show Steve has his own festival, which is Fusion Fest. He's got the T-shirt there. Yeah. Happens every March in the UK. It's the best um, UK progressive rock festival there is, in my opinion. Beautiful venue, high production values, incredible acts, yeah. you know, run by people that just love the music. Absolutely. So let's start with the festival. Yeah. Gentlemen. Well, we, we're not doing this for the money, guys. I know that's a bit of a cliche, but we're not. You know, we do it for the love of the music, love of the bands. And the fans, you know, we're fans as well as the people in the audience, mm. you know. And for me, I'd, I've been to so many gigs, and I'd imagine that you have as well, where you go and there's like a handful of people there. Mm. And although I'm not the one playing, I really do feel for the bands, you know. And I think, you know, you guys have put in all this time preparing, rehearsing and so on. I need to come out and play for ten people. And it must be so disheartening, even though, you know, you hear bands and they say, well, we'd play the same whether it was one person or a hundred people. At the end of the day, if you've got a live gig, the, the, the audience feed off the band, feed off the audience. Mm. You know, there's that two way yeah. thing going on. And so for me, that was probably the biggest reason for doing it. I just wanted to see the bands have a decent audience and also to introduce uh, followers, fans to newer music. Mm. You know, because like the one we've got coming up in March, we, as Andy said, we've got Solstice, we've got IQ, and we've got Mick Pointer Script, which are all very early 80s mm. bands. Yeah. But then also you've got newer bands like Veriditas, um, Cyan, Cairo, uh, The Emerald Dawn, who are getting a lot of attention at the moment, The Wood Demons. We've got a new band that nobody's heard of before called Fluctus Quadratum. Now, if that's not a problem, I don't know what is. <laughs> I like them already. <laughs> it's actually Latin for square wave, don't you know? And what, well, what, so what are these, what's that? This is, the, this is the thing about Steve. I know on his festival, 
he goes out of his way to put new bands on yeah. that bands people haven't heard on, try and put them against the big bands like yeah. IQ. And he really is spending his whole time trying to push modern prog. Absolutely. And he said to me a few weeks back, he said, I love all the old prog, but I've heard it to death. Yeah. And I, I'm just hungry for something new yeah. in yeah. the genre. And I think we all are, aren't we? You know. Yeah. So tell us a bit what they're well, called. Well, it was quite just... ironic, really, because when I first joined MMH, because mm -hmm. I've been with them now seven and a half years, yeah. Uh, I originally joined just to be a reviewer because I thought I'd get all the albums yeah, before yeah. everybody else, like, you know. Yeah. And that was the original reason why I joined. But then uh, years ago, I always had this hankering for doing a DJ. So I ended up doing that. And I now have been doing it for seven and a half years. And I absolutely love it because for me, it's a way of bringing new prog to people's ears. And bands like Fluctus Quadratum, who contacted me and said we would love to play the, the festival we want to play for free because we just want to be there mm. you know well how am i going to say no to that yeah, yeah you know what i mean they've only got one ep out at the moment with three tracks but you know from what i've heard it, it's incredible you know and i think we have to give these new bands the time of day because although the classic prog like the yes genesis gentle giant elp mm. all the usual what you call classic prog They've been around for donkey's years, tried and tested, well loved, and everybody is, is so familiar with that mm. music. I mean, I have played Lamb Lies Down Broadway to death, Tales from Topographic Oceans to death. I know these albums so well, it's unbelievable. And I suspect, you know, some of you guys have as well. Oh, they do. <laughs> <laughs> they know them. Every single day. Every yeah. single day. Well, what, what, what I try and do is, with the show and the festival, as Andy said, is to mix the old with the new because a lot if you look at a lot of prog documentaries and there's one on our youtube channel which was put out on the bbc a while back and it's had an absolute wealth of views it's very misorientating because it sort of pushes everything towards elp and yes it's not giving a, a modern take i think there's so much need for a, a new documentary on prog you know, to put people's perspectives in place. But the trouble is they can't get away from the sort of established media story that prog came out in the 70s. There was some quite good stuff. It was all a bit pretentious and overblown. That's right. And then punk came along and it yeah. showed that people how to do music properly and then prog died away. Yeah. Well, they look you at know. things like ELP when they went on the road and each member of the band had their own Arctic. Yeah. And uh, they went on tour with an orchestra, which yeah. totally bankrupt the band. And then you got uh, like Genesis with the flowers around his head and Yes doing their stage yeah. show with all the Roger Dean stuff going on. And that, that's what they tend to focus on. You know, and it's all wizards and goblins and all yeah. that kind of thing. And, it, and it's a very misguided view of what the genre is all about. I personally think it's bigger now than it's ever been. Well, for a start... People love wizards and goblins. If you, if you, if, if you make a film Lord with wizards, Rings. if you make a film with wizards and goblins in, you'll be held as genius. They want to love you, you know, and all that type of stuff, you know. Um, so I, I just don't get it. I love wizards and goblins. Yeah. I, I, and I, and well, there's me. a time and a place. There's a time and a place. And it was back in the seventies. Be gone. Be gone. And, <laughs> and so, um, but what do I feel is, is that prog didn't go away after punk. I think prog was already evolving into something else yeah. before punk came along, and you yeah. can see that. You yeah. know, yeah. I think that's that really has its roots in um, the second incarnation of King. Well, I've got the new wave of prog where you've got uh, Palace, Pendragon, yeah, got the, but, I think, but I think even before night. even before then, the ba the bands are evolving. You know, I think um, if you look at say Pink Floyd, we wish you were here. Yeah. You could see that sounds changing. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. seventy-five massive yeah. album. And then the wall, of course. Yeah. You, um, yeah. If you look at say, um, sort of like going for the one by Yes, which I, you know, doing this channel, my respect for that album has gone up more and yeah. more. And I think this is one of the great. Well, yes Awaken is seen as like. One of the greatest prog epics of all time. Oh, I think it's the greatest prog yeah. track of all time. But that sounds changed. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're exploring, yeah. you know, Lamb Lies Down, they're exploring the much oh, more yeah. American sound. And so you see that they're all they're already moving towards something. Yeah. And then by the late seventies, you've got a run of the biggest albums in the world. I'd I'd say like nine oh one two five Asia's yeah. debut album, <coughs> um, The Wall. Well, I, I feel sorry. For, uh, you may not have heard of a band. Uh, they're a UK band called England. And they bought out their debut album, I think, in 78. 
So the X six six called Garden Shed, and it's an absolute prog masterpiece. Masterpiece, yeah. And yet it was just, it just totally died a death because it came out when punk was very mm. much in the yeah. the mainstream, uh, and I really do feel that that band could have become as successful as Yes, yeah, because it's got that feel to it. But uh, it's just a shame that because it died a death, the band didn't proceed. I mean, they're still yeah. around now, and we had them on the same day as Focus. Uh, to Fusion 2 in 2019 yeah. and they actually reformed just for that gig yeah they and really are one of the great um, British prog bands I they're, think not, so. they're not the secret yeah you know one of these secret British prog bands well what because they hadn't played for so long and they, they wanted to come and you know perform on the Saturday night in the back of my mind I was thinking I know what's going to happen here they, they're going to reform, do the festival, realise how much they love doing live music, and they're going to do a tour, mm. which will totally take away the specialness of that night. But they didn't. They didn't. Yeah, they well. literally did just that one gig. You know, absolutely amazing. And yet last year they bought out a live album called The Concerts in Japan, mm. which was recorded in the early part of the new millennium. And I'll tell you, it was one of my best albums of the year. It is absolutely superb. You definitely need to check that out. The Concerts in Japan by England. It's amazing. Amazing live So, album. going back to this sort of thread, the way I see it is, is that, you know, you've got these huge progressive rock albums after that period. You know, bands like Genesis, yes, then you've got people like Kate Bush, Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins. They're all having huge yeah, careers. Yeah. You've <coughs> got the new wave of British heavy metal, which is like bands like Iron Maiden, yeah. are dripping with prog. You see the, the experimental prog in indie music. You see it um, then in the neo prog movement with IQ and Marillion. Marillion become one of the big, biggest bands. Then you get progressive metal. So there's a, there's a history that carries on yeah. forward. Yeah. And I think because of the story that has happened with this punk thing, you've got a hardcore prog audience that will not class some of these bands as being prog. So, for example, I would say Radiohead yeah. are, are as prog as any 70s prog band. Yeah. They should be embraced into the genre yeah. because they are a prog band yeah. and they do everything that prog bands do. But but I think the prog audience has, has itself closed down to anything yeah. new and they don't <coughs> want to... They, 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 it's, it's now the audience's fault for not going... Absolutely. They, it's, you know, it's almost a travesty, really, because you've got progressive rock by its very nature. It's an open-ended genre. And I mean, this is why the festival's called Fusion, Music Without Boundaries, mm. because I, I feel that totally sums up what prog's all about, because you can bring in elements of classical and folk that's and jazz it, yeah, and blues. That's exactly it. Uh, and, and it. And it's all good, do you know what I mean? Mm. If you're a metal band or a folk band, then you're expected to play metal and folk music. But with prog, from a musician's point of view, and obviously you can mm. allude to this, you know, it's got to be the most open-ended creative genre on the planet, because you can bring in literally elements of all kinds of music, and it's all good. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, although you've got the newer bands, which are taking what's gone before and running with it, bands like Haken, District 97, Thank You Scientist, you know, the list goes on. Young bands who are taking what's gone before and basically bringing it, kicking and screaming up to date. And I think there's not enough of that. People really need to embrace these bands and literally take them to the heart and give them the due credit that they deserve. We've got Kairos playing at our launch party on March the 2nd. Now they're doing the whole of their synesthesia yeah, incredible band. I, I love them, young, brilliant. Young kids, they're only in their 20s, yeah. and yet the music they do is just absolutely complex as hell. You know, if you want prog, they're there. You yeah. know. And we, were, we went to see Thank You Scientist, which is an American band, at a small venue in Birmingham, and the place was absolutely rammed. And yet they are so prog. Although you might think they're not, because you're basing it on what went before in the 70s. You have to appreciate, guys, the whole concept of prog is to move on, to be progressive, not regressive. And I think by staying in the 70s that you're being regressive. You know, whereas the whole concept of prog is to be open-ended and move with the times, you know, and I think we, we need to, as listeners as well, we need to embrace the change. Yeah, I, I've been talking about this on this channel now for two years, and I feel like I've got a much clearer idea of it, and I've changed my tune a little bit, I've, 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 I've mellowed. I think there is such a thing as retro prog, and they're bands that play in the style of classic 70s prog, and I love classic 70s <coughs> prog, and I don't have oh, a problem amazing. with it. And um, the, the, the problem I have with those bands 
is they don't use the same production methods. So you get a lot of computerization and they, they don't have the, the sort of joy and visceral energy that those original Progs bands have because yeah. it's, the, the Pro Tools has come in. Yeah. That, I realized that was my problem. So if you imagine you've got a retro Prog band here, then you've got a truly, like a band that is really pushing the boundaries of music. And that would be like a band like Black Midi that are really out there and they don't get classed as progressive rock mm -hmm. but Black Midi if they were in 1973 they would have got called a progressive rock band yeah, yeah. right and then in the <coughs> middle you can have both so my band Rain I feel that we've got elements of retro prog we yeah. do some of the stuff at the classic because we love yeah. it yeah, yeah. and we also try and push the yeah, boundaries yeah, definitely now yeah, there's a really radio the, silence new album definitely came voice. out yesterday and um I read the first review and it was a glowing review and they really liked it but this term came up and they said it's prog but not as we know it and then they <laughs> described it they said full of odd time signatures dark themes and, and, and big changes of style and I thought well, that's prog, that's prog. <laughs> you've just described prog you know that, that, it, so I, I, I think it's a difficult one I understand the prog audience they don't want to go and see some way out band that is being completely breaking the barriers mm. they do want something that sounds Safe. like that that sounds like prog. and i understand that i do yeah. understand it Safe. but i think the audience needs to open itself up a little bit yeah. and embrace and go you know th this is prog yeah but the, not as we know it yeah, yeah. Th th it needs yeah. to open i think it basically up. comes back to one question what is prog doesn't it really and, and I think everybody's got their own interpretation and definition of mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and it's based on your, how can I put it, your experience with mm -hmm. the music, you know, if you were brought up on it, because they say that the music you're into in your mid-teens is what will be stick with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, I, and I think some people haven't moved on from that, you know, because I mean, I was born in 57, so I grew up in the 70s, and I was going to see all the big prog bands at the, the local venues, and um, obviously it's been a major part of my life for the last 50 years in, in so many ways. In fact, it was one thing that brought me and my wife together. And here we are 44 years later, you know, so what can I say? Music is a unifying force. Mm. Uh, but I do feel that, and, and part of the reason I do the radio show, I, I mentioned the festival earlier, is to bring, you know, newer bands to people's attention. And in some respects, the radio show is a, an extension of that because it gives me the opportunity to bring new bands to our listeners' attention. So we mix in with the tried and tested people. Mm. We bring in bands. I mean, on this week's show, I've got a band from Luxembourg that nobody's ever heard of, and I've got a band from the Netherlands called The One, you know, and things like that. You know, you, I, because of what I do, I have to be on top of it and being totally... That's why I've got you in, and I know I'm not, you know, and I know that... Um, I've I've got the experience of actually working in the prog scene, yeah. so I've got the bands that I've worked with, and yeah. obviously you know when we formed Frost, so I was in IQ, which was like sort of an established prog band, <coughs> and then we formed Frost, and yeah. Frost it was a brilliant example of a band being full on prog, but also pushing the boundaries, yeah. and actually, and I think you know Frost changed, it's just a little bit, it changed the framework of what we class as. Prog. So you know, when you mention a band like Kairos, I, I see them almost in the yeah in the legacy of, of Frost, which I'm, vein. which I'm quite proud. They're in a similar vein of because they've covered Heartstrings as well. Yeah, they did a cover of Heartstrings off. Yeah, uh, I wasn't Saturday. on that one. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Million Town, what a classic. <laughs> so so um, I, yeah, I think it, it, it is a really complex one. Um, the other thing is, I think it's interesting that I'm going to throw in the mix as well. There's a lot of bands out there that are prog, but when they're interviewed, they say they're not because they don't want to get associated yeah. with the genre. Well, like, it's almost like a dirty magazine, isn't yeah. it? You, you want some prog? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Under the counter job, isn't it? <laughs> and the thing is, I was I was reading an interview with Sol. Well, they weren't actually it was on YouTube. I was watching an interview with Solstice the other day, and they said, "Well, we never really classed ourselves as prog." And it sort of put me off. I was about to listen to the album. And I thought, this sounds really good. And then I said that. And I thought, oh, God, maybe it's, it's probably a bunch of old folky stuff. And, you know, I thought, maybe I've got this wrong. So, and I, so I went to check the album out. And I put it, I went, this is prog. <laughs> oh, time ticks your funky grooves, yeah. folk influences, you yeah. know, um, yeah. flute solos. Yeah. I was like, what? Own it. Own it. Yeah, but I yeah. think that's what these... 
genre needs to do. We yeah. need to we need to be proud of the genre, and we need to be, open ourselves up and go. You know that that's prog, and that's not prog, yeah. but it's got it's, it's got prog. It's like uh, the, you know sitting quiet too. The only prog band. Yeah. You know, it's it's like almost like that they are, and they love the music, but they don't want to admit that they are. And I think it's all because of these misconceptions that people have got that have built up over the years. You know, that prog was very much a 70s thing, you know, and, and you can't escape that. And every documentary I've seen always focuses on that, and it really pisses me off, to be honest. When, when I was joined Frost, I was a fan of a young, up-and-coming band that wasn't that well known called Porcupine Tree oh, right oh, yeah. and Porcupine Tree I noticed that none of the prog audience wanted to admit they were prog oh I don't like them I'm not really yeah. that well even Stephen Wilson says he's and then Stephen Wilson was going around and said he's not prog you what know? did he call himself experimental jazz rock funk or something yeah and I, and I thought and then suddenly he then goes solo he does that Raven album and suddenly, oh, he's prog and now he's saying he's prog. And then I was watching an interview with him the other day and he wouldn't use the word prog. Oh, I know. And this is the big problem, I think. It's, yeah. it's the word. Yeah, yeah. What, do you, what would you say then would be a modern way of describing the music? Outer Limits. And that's from Prog Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they have that. They, they, the way they deal with bands that. that the prog audience wouldn't class as prog, is they call it. They 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 so you would the outer so you would use it as a blanket description. Yeah, out of, out of it. So the way I see it is is that you you've got rock and roll popular music, and inside that is straight down the line rock music, pop music that does the job of what it's supposed Whoa. to do. And I love that it's bands like ACDC, Status Quo. You know, um, just straight down line rock. And then, if you take that genre in any way whatsoever, like the Rolling Stones, they so take the Rolling Stones, they're straight down line rock band. If the Rolling Stones then want to do something different, push against, they're now going down into the outer limits. And some bands do that slightly, and some bands do it more. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll have an album, won't they? It's totally out of context. Is it that one, uh, Something of the Elder Boy, Kiss? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a totally off, off kilter thing. For oh, with the Stones, I mean, I mentioned the Stones, just I was trying to think, what's the most sort of just straight down the line rock and roll yeah. band? It's the Stones, yeah. but then they got the Satanic Majesties, which is my favourite album, and that's the one that, where they've gone prog, you know. And everybody, anybody can go prog, anybody can go prog, because what it is, it's, it's just taking the boundaries you're in and pushing against them, it's, it's pushing against the boundaries, and any band that does that is... Well, they get criticised. I mean, I mean, look at Opeth. I mean, they were dark metal, doom metal, yeah. you know, with all that, rah, 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 yeah, all yeah. that going on. And then the minute they started to do Pal Communion and Heritage, you know, they started going down a more prog route, and they got a lot of flack from the long term fans. Albums. Brilliant you know? albums. And yet, I, I, I do believe that a band has to achieve a certain level of success to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, that they've got to achieve a certain level of success where they can say, it, we need to change, you know, we need to move on or go into a different direction, but they've got to achieve that level of success in the first place. And hopefully then they'll take the majority of their fans with them and they'll understand the route they've gone. Not that I'm a massive fan, but I believe that happened with Linkin Park. They, I mean, my wife was a big fan of theirs. Mm. Their last album went totally different to what they'd done before. Uh, I mean, they're not around anymore, no. obviously, because Chester, unfortunately, took his own life. But... Um, you know, when a band decide to go on a different route, they get criticised, and yet I think they should be praised for mm. having the courage to do that. Yeah. And that's what prog's all about. Yeah, that that is basically <coughs> that's what prog is. As some bands, and any band can do it if they really push the boundaries out. Then to me, they're being progressive. Absolutely. And and I understand there's a genre there, and I really I I understand that you can also be prog which is to play in the style <coughs> of the genre but the problem I have with that is the prog audience is now picking which bands fulfill that which seems to be Genesis yes uh, well, Pink, back in Pink the day, Floyd to some extent but I see I've got people on this channel telling me every time I talk about Pink Floyd that they're not prog yeah. this is how bonk this is how bonkers the audience is is yeah, that is yeah. that Dark Side of the Moon is not prog it's a concept album it's, you know yeah, yeah. It, and, I, and I find because I think there's a the audience have decided what prog is, you know. Um, whereas actually, if you actually go back to the original bands, you know, Soft Machine, Can, Magma, they're all prog. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. a very wide 
yeah. style anyway. In the old days, any band that was pushing the limits, that was being progressive, yeah. got labelled progressive. Well, <laughs> I, we went to, uh, they had a, a, an exhibition at the art gallery in Birmingham, about Black Sabbath, mm. a few years ago. We went to it. And as you went in, there was this huge wall with like a family tree of bands, and right at the top was Black Sabbath. And then it went from that to doom, rock, jazz, you know, metal, mm. prog, metal, and all these different bands that had sort of evolved from Black Sabbath. And I think in some respects you've got the same with prog, because you've got all the classic bands like Yes, Genesis, Gentle Giant, mm. ELP, and mm. so on, right at the top. And then you've got everybody that's splintered from that. But the difference is with metal, is the metal audience is quite willing to accept Bring Me The Horizon, which are almost like dance music, but yeah. metal. Yeah. And if you saw that thing, you'd see the proliferation down to modern metal bands. The, the metal audience just takes it all in. Yes. And it's just one long line from they Sabbath do. all yeah. the way through. Yeah. But with the prog audience, it's like we've got this punk thing when that yeah. stops. And then we've got all these different things going on. Part of that is I think the audience for prog tends to be people that are a little bit anal retentive and they like boundaries. <laughs> they like to, they yeah, like everything yeah, yeah. in the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, so there's a whole yeah. host Very of blinkered. things. Very blinkered. Very blinkered. Know. And that, so we haven't got anywhere with this, but I think we've illustrated the problem that, that you get once you get into this genre. Let's talk about, um, just over the last year, point some of the viewers to this, a couple of albums and a couple of bands that have really... Um, you know, hit hit um, done some my, great albums. My ten albums for last year, my ten favourite albums. I've mentioned England, the concerts in Japan, who were a very well established band. Yeah. But then there was a band um, albums like uh, Miles from Nowhere by Jonas Lindbergh and the Other Side. If you've never come across them, if you like Spock's Beard, yeah. very much in a similar vein. Um, and then you've got uh, obviously. Last year was an incredible year for music, I thought. Mm. We, we did um, a 2022 look back uh, just after Christmas and we filled two shows. I could have done four. I could have done four. Mm. You've got Von Ertz and Brothers, you've got Cosmograph, Pattern Seeking Animals, you know, which are obviously a splinter band from Spock's Beard. Um, Tears for Fears brought out a new album for the first time in 18 years. Uh, Jethro Tull brought out The Zealot Gene, which was the first album for 18 years. It was, a, it was an incredible year for music, and I think this one's shaping up to be just as good, especially with the new album from Rain. Yeah, we've got Radio a new album out. Um, available now on Bandcamp. Go there immediately. Rain, Radio Silence on GP <laughs> Records. and uh, I will be talking about that on this channel, because I really want to get into prog and try and expose the prog world a little bit, which is why I've got Steve in, so people can understand it a little bit better, and I will be following the trajectory of the release of this <coughs> album. There's going to be a video when I, where I talk about the new album and really talk about, you know, what it's like to be a modern prog band releasing an album, yeah. the sort of things you hit. Um, so an an that, another album that comes to mind from last year is uh, by a French guy called Vivian Lalou. He just goes under the name of Lalou. Uh, his album, Paint the Sky, it's got uh, lyrics, uh, vocals by Damien Wilson. An absolutely incredible no, I, I, album. I heard, listened to that the other day. Absolutely yeah. incredible album. Yeah. You know, and when you start to look outside the UK, because although the UK has got a thriving prog scene, the minute you start to look outside the UK, the the Nordic countries, mm. Europe, America is incredible. Glasshammer, if you've never come across them, they've been around for donkey's years. I got into them, I think, around about 2000 with Chronometry. Their latest, which was a series of three albums, and the last two were just incredible. It was a trilogy. And he's telling a story. Uh, At the Gate was the album they released mm. last year. It was an incredible album. Um, so you've got bands that have been around for a while, bringing out the yeah. latest album. And then you've got newer bands that you may not have come across before. And there's just so much music out there. I get bombarded with new releases literally every week. You know, bands send me albums, I'll get downloads. You know, I've got more music to play than there is shows. You know, I could probably put a show on every day and play new music because there's that much coming out. <clears throat> but I think what you have to do is step outside the UK. That's the secret. Because although the UK has got a really promising, a really uh, on-stream prog scene, then you have to look outside the UK. Because it, outside the UK, it is huge. Absolutely huge. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's really interesting that this is because... Um, 
I know that from being in playing in prog bands is that you know you you say IQ British prog band they will do 500 people you know in the UK they go to Holland it's over a thousand people exactly they go to Canada it was yeah. over a thousand people yeah. so you, you realize that yeah. that audience was there yeah for them um, uh, and the audience don't seem as prejudiced against no, prog, so there's more younger <coughs> they're more open-minded yeah. to it and I, and I think that's and again, I think we've mentioned this earlier, you know, you can't blame bands like Pendragon Arena, Threshold mm. and so on, yeah. for going over to Germany. I mean, Saga, the, you know, the Canadian band, they are absolutely huge in Germany. Absolutely huge. We've got a live album of theirs, uh, and it was like a massive stadium. They played the Robin in Bilston, and there were like 30, 40 people, and you couldn't see the stage with keyboards, you know. You imagine, you know, a stadium set up, on a, a very small stage, that's what it was like, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, if they don't come back again, is, is it not understandable? Enchant, I love that band to bits. Uh, Ted Leonard's band, who's with Spock's Beard. Mm. I mean, they came over, uh, again, American band, came over to the UK, went to see them at Robin, 25, 30 people. And they've come over from America. You know, and so if they don't come over again, we've only got ourselves to blame because mm. we haven't supported these bands. We've got a band playing at uh, Fusion in a few weeks' time called Orpheus Nine. The very first time they've come to the UK ever, and I feel really honoured that they're coming over. You know, it, it, you've got to do this. You've got to look outside the UK. It's very easy to sort of focus on what's going on in the UK and and not even think about what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, I was talking to Rick Waitman once after a gig and he said it's a bit like going into a supermarket and you go to the, uh, the, the area where there's tea and there's three different types of tea <clears throat> and that's all you've ever been used to and then one day somebody opens a cupboard underneath and there's about 30 different types of tea and you go I never knew that was there and he was saying that in South America they are so switched on you know, to what's going on in the world with Prague, he said they are totally in touch with everything that's going on. UK bands, European bands, everything. And I'd imagine from a musician's point of view, it must be quite refreshing, you know, to go over there and get that kind of feedback. My wife bought a live DVD, Blu-ray thing for Nightwish, mm. live in uh, Rio de Janeiro, I think. And the audience just going absolutely apeshit. You know, it, it's just... A joy to see, you know, the band getting that kind of a, a feedback. It's, I mean, the thing, <coughs> the, I mean, the thing that shocked me is this YouTube. You know, I've sat, started talking about jazz fusion and prog, so I pulled all that together. I also talk about classic rock and I talk about jazz, so I have that. Yeah. And, and and strangely, I've now st started to build this community up. You yeah. know, there's a whole bunch of people who watch this, you know, and they're interested in all this. They're all out there, and you look at them. You know, there's a few thousand people watching this channel now. It's growing all the time, you know, and I and I really feel that this could be a vehicle for actually pushing out new bands, new fusion bands, and new prog bands, and yeah. giving you know trying to get it to the audience direct. Yeah. Which, as you said, what's what really interesting is this audience is now spread. It's all, it's all over the world, isn't Massive. it? Yeah. So and it's and I I know this is the case. It's really difficult for us in the prog bands to go and do a gig because you know if you turn up, you're going to have twenty five people there exactly. because because in that town. <clears throat> You won't have the audience. The audience is now worldwide for this. It's, yeah. a, it's it's a niche thing, but it's worldwide, and then that the audience is bigger. and And I think the technology is slowly getting there. And I think you know maybe we need to get a structure that's in better for radio stations like yours, um, YouTube's like mine, and then things like the Fusion Fest, where you have done the work, you get an audience in now. So all those bands that play your festival will be guaranteed to be. In front of you, hundred people, and it will, and you've got high production values, decent sound, decent lights. Well, if you think about it, guys, when when you if you go to a festival, although obviously food and drink are, are up there as necessities, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the merch and facilities like toilets and parking and things like that, ultimately, what you have to boil it down to, what is the most important thing? The sound. You go in there to a music festival, guys. You know to listen to the music. So for me. That has to be a priority above everything, above foods, uh, drink, toilets, parking, the whole lot. It's all about the sound. Mm -hmm. And the guy that we use, he totally nailed it. 
because it's at the Civic Centre in Stourport and his sound quality is just absolutely on another level. You could sit on the front row and not go, ye God, that's too loud. Mm. You know, he's, he's just the sound is absolutely superb. I've had nothing but very favourable feedback mm. from bands and no, uh, no actual feedback. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got to be the most important thing is the sound, and I've been to so many gigs where you literally got to put earplugs in, you know, because it's way too loud, and and I, it, it's not about that. It's about quality, not volume. I mean, there's a young band, Miron, who you may be familiar with, who plays with Andy in uh, Rain, was previously in a band called Hey Jester, and uh, I, I was working closely with the guys. And we, I got him a support gig with This Winter Machine at the Robin. And uh, I went there for the sound check. And they come off stage and they said, what was it like? And I said, really, really loud and distorted. And on that, I figured that they'd have a word with the sound engineer to drop the volume down. When they played, it was exactly the same volume. And I came off stage and I said, what was it like? I said, it was just too loud. You know, and I, and I think that's the trouble. It's, you, you're not getting the quality. You're just getting this volume, this wall of sound. And it's all right when you're at a metal gig. I mean, I've got tinnitus in that ear from going to too many loud gigs. You know, it's not about volume, it's about quality. And, I, and again, I think that's something that's overlooked these days. You know, it's the sound of the band, not so much the volume. And again, this is the main reason I do the festival. You know, to give bands the opportunity to play at a level that's sensible and not blowing people away. Well, the know? thing is, is that being on the other side of it and playing <coughs> in prog bands, what you've got is almost like an inversion of what you had in the 70s. So those 70s bands were selling millions of albums. They had huge budgets. They could go into, and rehearse for like two months on a sound stage. They could spend two months making an album. Um, and so they, they had, a, they had a, a structure behind them to be epic and huge. Now prog bands are trying to do the same thing, but they're having to do it in a really constricted situation. Because so, they haven't got the budget. Yeah, everyone's making albums in their bedroom, which yeah. means you're not getting real performances. It's all yeah. sort of dialed in. And then they're having to fix it all with the door. And I've got a problem with that. I think that's ruining. It just doesn't give the sound of proper prog for me. Um, then you've got like minimal rehearsal time. You know, you, you go into a venue that, where you're probably playing for nothing. You, you're paying to get there and then there's 20 people in there. Oh. And so we really need a strong prog structure, which is there, you know, it's always been there. It's, it's under threat a little bit, but guys like you, what you do, and the radio stations, the YouTubes, the festivals, th that really needs to be consolidated and just strengthened. Yeah. And I think, and the audience for it has to realize, I think this is the message of this video. If you're a prog fan, support, the style, yeah. you know, and as much as I may criticize modern prog, you know, and I say, oh God, they sound like Pink Floyd, blah, 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 but I support this genre 100%. Yeah, it's yeah. so important yeah. because because I love the music. And, and the truth is we do need people pushing the boundaries still. We, yeah. we still need people experimenting and taking it out because it's wonderful to hear in the end, you know. Because if we don't support it, guys, either by buying the albums or going to live gigs, you know, if a band suddenly thinks, well, it's just not worth us doing it anymore, yeah. you know, then it will die. You know, as a genre, it will die. Personally, I don't think it will because it's too big, it's too strong. But there's always that potential that a band could think, what's the point anymore? You know, nobody's listening to us. If we do a gig, nobody comes, mm -hmm. you know. We really do need to support it. We really do. So what I'm going to do, this this video is a bit of an introduced introduction to Steve and what he does. It was a bit of introduction to this idea. So um, I'm going to bring Steve in every now and then. He's probably going to bring five albums in of the best prog out there. Stuff that sounds like inside the genre, you know, the really high quality retro prog, but also stuff pushing the boundaries. I'm going to represent it all on here, you know, really to try and start to use this YouTube. And hopefully you guys will be interested. If you trust me and you know what I like, you know what I like. And you, I know what you like, so hopefully <laughs> Steve knows what I like. And I know what Steve... I know what I like in your wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, so before we finish up, let's just try and do this. Is that The big, the album that seems to be really making waves at the moment is the new Riverside album. Have you heard it? Identity, yeah. What's it? Even so, though the first track sounds like a ha. Oh, does it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a, a new track from a ha. Because I've always thought that Marius Duda's vocals mm. are very similar to Morton yeah. Harkis. 
out of a ha anyway. Yeah. I've always called Riverside a prog a ha. So I don't know much about Riverside. So give us a bit of a this is this this guy knows this stuff. So give us a little <coughs> bit of Riverside's history, how long they've been doing, what they've done. They've been going for about, oh Jesus, about 12 years, 10, yeah. 12 years. I went to see them the first time when they came to the UK. They did two dates. They did London mm. and uh, Lydney Town mm. Hall, which is this tiny little venue. And uh, again, it wasn't particularly well populated, mm. but uh, over in Poland, they're like the best prog band. Mm. And again, they're, they're applauded for that, you know. And how will you describe them for those who don't um, know the band? I suppose you could put them in a similar vein to Porcupine Tree. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. If you like Porcupine Tree, you like Riverside. They have mellowed over the years. Mm. The earlier albums, there was a lot of, you know, the mm. what I call Cookie Monster vocals. Yeah. Um, they have seemed to have mellowed away from that now. Uh, and like I say, the first track, Friend or Foe, on the new album is very aha. Mm. You know, it's not all like that, guys. It's not all like that. But uh, I've always liked Aha. Mm, I yeah. think they are an excellent band. But um, I suppose if you a very proggy Aha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> I might have to title the video that. I think I'm gonna call this video a very proggy Aha. <laughs> And then I'll put a line in there and look at the modern prog scene. And then people go, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you put me off now with that. <laughs> no, you do need to listen to it. You do need to yeah. listen to it. There's no epics. You know, they don't do epics. So in that respect, they're a bit like Gentle Giant, you know, yeah. they don't do epics. Uh, but there are some long tracks, you know. Um, there's a live album they did uh, called Lost and Found. We went to see them at the, uh, oh, is, is it the Leamington Spa Assembly Room? Yeah. And they released this live album purely at gigs mm. called Lost and Found. I think it's now available, you know, over the counter type of thing. But at the time it was only available at gigs. That's probably a good place to start. Start for them, yeah. yeah Lost and Found. And what, why do you think this new album's making so much waves? Uh, the well, scene? it's their first album since Wasteland. Yeah. Uh, it's their first album for five years. Uh, they've got a new guitarist uh, because Piotr Grzynski uh, unfortunately passed away. I think he was only 40. Mm. Uh, incredible guy and a tragic loss. Wasteland was recorded in the aftermath of his death. Mm. And I think the feel and the lyrics within that obviously were influenced by the fact that they lost him. And so it was a very dark album in some respects. But I feel that now they've got... I ain't even going to try and pronounce the new guy's name. Yeah. <laughs> I'll probably get it wrong. But um, I feel that they've, it's a comeback album for them, mm. you know, in some respects, because it's got a lot more upbeat to it. It's... Um, more back to what your class is like a typical riverside sound you know i think yeah, so wasteland like, was not depressing but obviously it had that element because it was in the in the aftermath of losing the guitarist uh now that he only came in originally doing the live gigs mm. but now he's now a fully fledged member of the band so i think it's like a rebirth in some yeah. respect for the band you know and i think the fact that it's their first album for five years you know it's uh, it's a good comeback I think when when you're in a band, it's like you don't realise it because you don't do it on purpose. But when you make an album, it is really about what is going on. Yeah. And often things like that can really make an album um, have a certain vibe to it. When I joined IQ, I had to go through every single album, learn them all, <laughs> uh, and they're all great albums. Yeah. But for me, the greatest IQ album is ever, and ever was made after. You know, John had just come into band. John Jarrett joined yeah. on bass because their previous bass player, legend. Uh, had commit suicide. He died just before the oh, album was made, and you can feel that yeah. that that just goes through yeah. the whole album. <coughs> and it's, it's just, inevitable, really. Yeah, they, these yeah. are the things that make albums great. It's it's it's, it's the lives that the people live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, you know, with my band Rain, you know, we with that first album was made in lockdown, and it's just got such a vibe to it. And yet, radio silence is like the opposite. It's almost like we're just we've gone. Yeah, we're in the real world now. You know, we can we can talk to each other. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it's yeah, just so much. Yeah. It's it's so much bigger. 
a livelier, you know. Um, so I, it's, it's interesting, but, you know, I, I will go and have a listen to it. I've, it is I've worth seen, a listen. It's I've, definitely I've, worth a listen. I've seen everyone raving about it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I usually go when you're grumpy. I'm one of those people that's, oh, what's this new prog band? You know, There's actually a deluxe version of the album, which is two CDs. And on the second CD, I think there's four extra tracks. Mm. Two are instrumentals, which I played one on last week's show. And the other two are single edits of tracks off the main album. But I think the difference in price is quite substantial. So you've got to weigh it up, guys, mm. whether you want to pay the phenomenal amount of money to buy the deluxe version when all you're actually getting is two extra mm. tracks, which are both instrumentals. They're good, but you've got to weigh it up whether it's worth spending the extra money. Mm. But it's definitely a good album, definitely worth listening. If you are a grumpy old prog fan like me, and you listen <laughs> to this and thinking, well, I do want to <coughs> check out some of these new bands, but where do I start? The best place, honestly, is Steve's radio show because you will still get a whole ton of old prog. Absolutely. And you'll still get a, that, and he'll put it next to the... He, he, he always puts the tracks next to yeah. similar. I'd say, go on, there's yeah. a Genesis track, and then there's something that you might like. because And, and it's, it's a great show. Plus, um, I, I had to listen to your interview with Francis, which was fantastic. You know, uh, Francis was on form, yeah, you know, yeah. as he always is. Yeah. So he got some... a bit political at times. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> I mean, you asked him a question. He was... <laughs> I try not to be too political. Yeah, no, you? I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. You know. and we he... also have my wife involved as well. She plays, she sort of contributes to the middle hour. Yeah. You know, because she, she's, I mean, music's been a unifying force for us since we met, you know, 48 years ago. Uh, and even now, it's still a huge part of our Her life. tastes seem heavier than yours. She's, she is more down that route. She does like a bit I, of I've the... nicknamed her Raucous Rita. <laughs> <laughs> but she's adopted a number of different uh, acronyms. I think there was uh, Proggy Priscilla, Raucous Rita, uh, Metallic Melinda. She's got all these different identities. And uh, we never really know which one she's going we, to go. We've got a champion, the prog ladies. Absolutely. Because they don't get... I've, I've, I've been a bit negative towards the prog ladies on this channel, you know, and I think I cracked a joke, which was along the lines of that Lord of the Rings thing, you know, about the dwarves, you know, when they ask if they're female dwarves, it's like, well, they are, but they get mistaken for the male dwarves. I think it's the beards. You know that bit? Yeah. <laughs> But prog ladies don't have beards, you know, I'm not saying... Uh, well, they might have. <laughs> might be like Monty Python, and, you know, they have to buy one. Yeah. Now, the, um, you've got bands like Cairo, who've yeah. got a female front vocalist, Ailey Griffiths Band, who are pl both are playing at uh, Fusion. Uh, Emerald Dawn, you've got Tree Stewart on keyboards. Uh, Ebb, Erin mm. Bennett Band, are predominantly female. Um, yeah, I I'm totally up for that. Yeah, you know, totally yeah, up we, for that. yeah I think it's, it's a bit of a... Well, there is, there is some truth <coughs> in it, you know. It's like when you're doing a prog gig, you will never do. Will all the, will all the boys in the room say, yeah? yeah. Will all the girls in the room say, hello? <laughs> 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 I always find it amusing at the Robin, if ever, like, somebody like Mostly Autumn, who got, uh, who always had, they had uh, Heather Finley, yeah. and now they've got Olivia Spahn and Josh. Uh, there's always some sad bastard down the front with the camera, you know, taking all the pictures, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, they... <laughs> I mean, I think the big part of Solstice's rebirth is Jess Holland. She's brilliant. What? What a, a talent. Voice. What a talent. And, and there's also, so much joy. But she's brought the songwriting edge as well. Yeah. She's she's yeah. she's come in as a songwriter, not just a singer. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. I and was blown was, away by these two albums. Mid twenties or something. Yeah, absolutely. Or? This is what we need. There's a whole bunch of young people who are into prog. You know, it's it'll never you go away. It'll you. never go away. Anyway, <coughs> I think we've we've done um we've done nearly fifty minutes here. We're gonna be up at the hour, it's a, <laughs> it's a long slogger. All the all you hardcore fans, you're now at the back of this video. Hello you four. Left watching. <laughs> you know, if I you're still with us. If you're still with us, you know, put it in the comments. We made it to the end, Andy. <laughs> you know, you know, and I you know, the bit when I start talking about ferrets. Do you like ferrets? Oh, it depends what you're going to do with them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so I like to get, you know, that, that's my, my secret code is we've got the ferret code. So right? if you got to the end, tell us what you think about ferrets at the bottom, whether you like them or whether you think they're a pest. <laughs> <laughs> or what do you want to do with them? Yeah, what would you do with a ferret yeah. if you had the choice? Yeah, in your wildest dreams. <laughs> We've got to stop here because we're getting silly. You know, I get silly when I'm on my own, but now Steve's That's here. Oh, we're right. going to get really silly. <coughs> we so. need to get silly. So, um, 
If you like this video, like it. If you want to see some more, subscribe and um, press, press the notification bell and that'll tell you I've got new videos coming out. Um, if you want to go even deeper and darker, I am going to be filming now. Um, over here, I've got a whole bunch of very rare John McLaughlin vinyls and I'm going to be playing them Ooh. for my patrons, playing Ooh. some very rare stuff going back to 1963. Ooh, wow. You know. Uh, and that's what will be on Patreon this week. So there's a whole ton of exclusive content there, <coughs> and I'm, you know, at some point I'm going to get. Um, and I've just give Andy two. Oh, you see, see, he knows what I like. Really, yeah. I like the prog. Two Jacku Pastorius. I, I, I like the prog, but in the end, really, my heart's. I'm a fusion guy. <laughs> I'm a fusion guy. You know, I I like prog when it's got a touch of the fusion about it, which most yeah. of it has. Yeah. You know, most yeah. of it has. You know. And if you want to get out of that route, and a last note, probably the best, <coughs> what I would call entry level album that sort of touches on jazz fusion and prog, and I'm sure Andy will agree with me on this. Romantic Warrior, Warrior by, by Return, Return to, to Forever. Forever, without a doubt. Yeah, the greatest instrumental prog album ever made. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's yeah. more prog than any prog. Yeah, more prog than any actual prog album. <laughs> <laughs> The jewel of the jester and the tyrant. That's it. That's it. And the first <laughs> album to feature a polymoog. Was it? I didn't yeah. know. You've given me a return to River fact. I didn't know. Yeah. Rob Robert Moog actually rushed it through so that Chick Corea could have used on the album. I did not and it know was that. The very first polyphonic Moog on that particular album. It's so, it's it's so incredibly produced. It's got the most yeah. incredible sound ever. Yeah. That that album has anyway. We'll come back. We might have to. I might have to get pick his brain about fusion. <laughs> he's a big fusion. And this guy's also he's also oh. a big synth fan. He's oh, a yeah. big synth fan. Keyboard, well. synth, mellotrons, you name it. Yeah. So you love Tangerine Dream and oh yeah, what's it, Klaus Schultz and all yeah, those yeah, people, yeah, yeah. which I don't know that much about, and yeah, I would yeah. love to get into. I do. I do um, yeah. like Tangerine Dream yeah. a lot, and I've got a few albums by him. But that would be a band that would be great. Yeah. You know, yeah, so we're going to finish there. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video. And uh, bye, 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 bye.